eggs from rescued chickens that live like in someone's backyard and they're well cared for. They're treated like, like you would treat a dog or a cat, right? What would be the harm? So I appreciate that your channel discusses domestication of animals in a way that other vegans do not discuss it. I don't think I thought about it as much as I did after I saw your channel, uh, but I did think about it, how it's so inconsistent that um, at the time I was living with cats in my house. So I would feed them meat and it felt very wrong. It felt strange. And also the fact that they are just in your house and not able to roam free. Where I was living was an apartment. They were not able to go outside and, you know, even walk in the grass or anything. Abat le ciel. So feeding them meat did not feel right. Um, and then, you know, I, I saw your channel and more of the discussion about just captivity in general. And I thought that that was really yeah. interesting because nobody sees it that way. People see it as you love your animals, you love your pets, you're treating, you're giving them a better life than what they could, have. you're rescuing them from a bad situation that they could be living in. Right. And I just thought that that was really interesting. So, uh, you know, I was explaining to my sister-in-law how I have these more, this moral quandary with, I am living with these cats, but I don't feel like it is right for me to be living with cats. Um, or just keeping them in captivity. And she said she felt the exact opposite. She thought that because we have the capability, because they have the resources to feed animals, then we should rescue as many animals as possible. She actually felt guilty for not having any pets at the time. They have a newborn baby, so she was saying it's not quite the right time to have a, you know, have a pet. But in the future, they hope to adopt and, you know, rescue and adopt animals. Yeah. So it was just a, an interesting conversation with her. She said, you know, why would you not think that having pets would be better um, if you are, you know, a vegan and you care about animals and uh, want them to be in a good situation? Why would you not keep them yeah. in your home? Like, it, I think it is really common for people to just think that this is how it should be. This is how animals are happy, they're happiest with right. a loving so, caregiver as a human. But to stick with that with that example, did the conversation go anywhere after that or did it, did it just kind of stop? Like there was nowhere mm, further to go? No, you know, it's, you, we started talking about farm animals too because um, I said, yeah. I don't think it's right for me to treat one animal as food for another. So cows as food for cats. Right. I, that To me, that's just inconsistent and I can't really justify it. Um, so she said, Bo, oh, oh, well, you could have a you could have a pet that's an herbivore. You could have yeah. a, um, a cow. You could have a pet cow. I mean, and <laughs> we did talk about, or I told her about yeah, how yeah, 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 yeah. irrational that would be to actually try to have a pet cow as we, as I was living in an apartment at the time. <laughs> you could not have a pet cow. Put the cow in the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, but you would not have to feed it meat. But I still said, you know, I still would not right. think it's right to have a pet cow. Um, but it is it is an interesting question to me if you know because there are these farm sanctuaries where right. cows are taken and when they cannot be put back in the wild, what are you supposed to do with these animals that do get rescued from from a factory farm? Well, the word natural, the adjective natural, is a shorthand for a lot of very complex thoughts and ideas. But I think a lot of people, if you had a cow in your apartment their immediate reaction would be to say, well, that's unnatural. <laughs> if you had a sheep or a you know, goat in your apartment, they'd say that's unnatural. But they see a dog and they, they think that's, that's natural. And I've gotten long emails from people defending the idea that like somehow dogs are evolved yeah. to live on your carpet. Like, this, like they're, they're really engaging in a, a naturalistic fallacy. Yeah. You know, just because something is socially perceived as normal, that therefore it's natural. Yeah. And I think that puts veganism on the same footing as, as the meat eaters. The same way meat eaters can say, hey, for thousands of years we've done this. Therefore, it's natural. Therefore, it's normal. Well, and there's a sense in which I agree with meat eaters. You know, eating turkey at Thanksgiving is normal. Mm -hmm. I also want you to stop. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah, uh, but it's not a nat it's not natural what we do to animals now nowadays. I mean, the just the domestication must yeah. have been very difficult. We were talking about wild yeah. boars the other day. Like they're very, you know, hard to deal with. They're not <laughs> easy to domesticate animals. I don't think. Sure. They, they seemed well. Okay. Look, I mean, you know, look. Obviously, there are a lot of fallacies in naturalistic thinking, and in terms of ethics, I don't think we're ever talking about what's natural. We're talking about doing the best that you can which is a very different set of criteria. Mm -hmm. um, what's the best I can do for a cow or, or what have you, if, if you do rescue a cow. Mm -hmm. But I mean, one word you used in your own dis description of that conversation there mm -hmm. 
is just captivity. Mm-hmm. And it's hilarious to me that, that that concept is completely missing from the, the, the whole rhetoric of... So you were contrasting um, sanctuaries and rescues and pets and uh, companions. So it's not your captive, it's your, it's your companion, you yeah, know? right, and it's not really your companion because yeah. when you, at least um, when, I was, when I was really young, we had a kitten, or we had two kittens. Yeah. And you can see it's not, it's not your companion, it's not your friend. You're yeah. teaching it how to be a certain way. You're teaching it you how to fit to into your life as a yeah, human, how right. to fit into your apartment mm-hmm. or your house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and you have to... Yeah. Mm. Teaching you where to pee and where not to pee, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, that reminds me of the Rick and Morty episode with the dog. They, they stick in its, sticking its face and right, pee. Right, right, <laughs> it's right. pee. It's, it, Rick and Morty is a comedy TV show, but it has a number of episodes that are bizarrely pro-vegan or talk about actually vegan and animal rights issues for whatever reason. Yeah, Yeah. so when you're first training a, ca- a cat or a dog to live indoors, you have to train it to not pee indoors. And that's yep. pretty unnatural for a dog or for any animal. You know, it's unnatural for... It's unnatural for a zebra. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if I can get the zebra to live in my apartment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you have to train a dog, and I don't think that you would train a companion. Ideally, you would not train your friend to be your friend. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, big a, a natural vegan, we can cut in the, the clips here. She has this line of argument mm-hmm. where she says keeping a dog as a pet is just as moral as keeping a hen... A, a mm-hmm. chicken as a pet and eating its eggs <laughs> and and love it like a dog like love a right. backyard hen like your dog right so her whole line of reasoning is it is morally acceptable to keep a dog in captivity mm-hmm. <laughs> in perpetuity until it dies to castrate it she's argued at length that castrating a dog is not causing it any suffering how you define suffering that way i have no idea there's a lot of mental and moral gymnastics going on here but taking domesticated animals as her standard domesticated the most familiar domesticated animals namely dogs and cats she then extends that to slightly less familiar animals like chickens Mm -hmm. and says therefore it's perfectly fine to keep a, a chicken in captivity and she does this it's a mode of reasoning i don't have a name for by basically saying hypothetically if you were in the chicken's position how would you feel mm-hmm. now that's you could call it sympathetic reasoning how how would i feel if i were in the chicken's position yeah, yeah. and i mean sometimes that's a useful mode of thought and sometimes it can be profoundly misleading so she offers the argument in isolation if she were the chicken she wouldn't care that these you know hairless biped apes were eating her period secretions, eating her, her eggs, yeah. just so long as those hairless apes were loving toward her and so on. Yeah. I, I find this a really tortuous and impossible to, impossible to defend uh, line of reasoning. And no, you can ask yourself, if you were being held captive, because that's what we're talking about here, we're talking about captivity. Mm-hmm. It can be a cage, it can be cageless, it can be free, it can be a, you know, a wooden hut in your backyard. You're talking about holding a hen in captivity. Mm-hmm. And the nature of the captivity can't be understood by contrasting it to the f- more familiar captivity we keep dogs and cats in, which is the line of reasoning she's made. You have to contrast it to how that animal would live in the wild. Mm-hmm. What would be the natural behaviors of a chicken in the wild? And I just Googled it before making this video. It ain't hard to Google. It ain't hard. You can you can look up what do wild chickens look like? How do they live? How do jungle fowl exist in the jungles of Indonesia or Cambodia for that matter, other places I'm more familiar with. But you know, how do they live? What are their behaviors? I have seen them running around. You know, they 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 run around and catch uh, small insects like crickets, which can be quite inspiring to see. It's quite an elegant set of predatory behaviors they have. I've seen them in the jungle defending their own chicks. You know, if they feel you're too close to them, you get the, the mother hen walking with the line of chicks behind her, which is quite quite a striking sight. And, you know, still to this day, the fighting cock, the fighting chicken is the, the national symbol of France. They're known for being quite proud, um, pugnacious, confident, Birds, little birds that'll, they're birds that'll start a fight with a fully grown human kind of thing. Same with turkeys. Turkeys are like that too, mm-hmm. where they'll kind of be territorial and they won't, they won't behave as if they're afraid of you. Ironically, we use the word chicken to mean coward in English today, but yeah. they were known for their, their bravery. And of course, they're known for fighting one another, having these complex social behaviors. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have complex mating behaviors where the males offer food to the females and males fight other males to show who's the better mate and so on. This whole world of social and instinctual behaviors is what chickens are cut off from 
in their captivity in your backyard. And we have unnatural vegan saying, I think there's a direct quote. She simply asks, what's the harm? Yeah. What would be the harm? What's the harm of having of having a, a chicken in a cage? And I, I mean, again, I think she's really engaging in sophistry in the truest sense, in the ancient Greek sense of sophistry. It's a it, This is a misleading argument to say, well, if we're not harming a dog by doing this to a dog, therefore we're also not harming a chicken by doing this to a chicken. And in a, in a sense, I agree because I think we are harming the dog. We're harming a dog to cut its testicles off, mm -hmm. uh, and we're harming a chicken to give it this life uh, in captivity. And she does. I've seen her repeatedly engage in this line of thinking when she justified um, giving cats a hysterectomy. So, you know, fixing cats where you remove all the reproductive organs of cats, which mm -hmm. totally changes their behavior, totally changes their, their character and their yeah. hormones to, to an amazing extent. And her line of reasoning was if she was in the cat's position, she would prefer to have this hysterectomy yeah. because you prefer to be fixed rather than to feel sexual desire and not be able not to, be able to satisfy. The sexual desires, yeah. Not, not everyone feels that way. Yeah. <laughs> like, if I've got to spend the rest of my life in jail, real, this is a real question, yeah. would, in, in solitary confinement or only with medicine, would I rather be castrated or not? <laughs> I would take or not. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a really bizarre question. But even in framing the question that way, you, you've dislocated the ethical issue from the real context of how this animal would live in the wild. Um, I'm not saying the life of a cat in the wild is great. I mean, yeah. Oh, so this issue of being loved comes mm -hmm. up again and again. Mm -hmm. So you have like a, a sheep as a pet and you shear it and you and you wear its its waste. Again, we're talking about essentially a waste product, something that would go to waste if it were not used. Again, if assuming that the, the sheep, that the animal is well cared for and loved and all of that and not harmed, what is the harm? What What is wrong with that situation? Um, eggs from rescued chickens that live like in someone's backyard and they're well cared for. They're treated like, like you would treat a dog or a cat, right? I think a really good example would be, a, again, a backyard hen. You know, having a hen uh, who produces unfertilized eggs and then consuming those eggs. Assuming the hen is well cared for and loved and all of that kind of stuff, uh, what would be the harm? Um, do we really think that a chicken, if a chicken could care, that she would care about us consuming her period? Why would it be relevant to the chicken in captivity whether or not it is loved by these biped apes mm -hmm. that tend to it and eat its eggs? Or what? Do you, so you want to say that? Because if you're if you're a captive, if you're a captive in prison, yeah, your prison conditions matter and so on. Uh, we don't justify prison because the prisoners are loved by their prison guards. It's irrelevant and surreal and bizarre to, to offer that argument. It just makes no sense to me, you know? Yeah, so I was going to say Tobias and Unnatural Vegan, I think they don't want veganism to come off as crazy. And I think yes. when I was talking to my sister-in-law about this topic, she did think it was a little crazy that I was against having cats and dogs in your house. Uh, because it's so common and it's so, it seems natural. But I don't, sorry, I was going to go. Look, 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 I think this video, I think is long enough. I think we can cut this up. We have a couple different videos on related topics here. But, you know, you, it's a very good point where you say their concern and how they address this is vegans seeming crazy. Because mm -hmm. I would say my concern with this topic is vegans actually being crazy. Yeah. And people have sent me fan mail or feedback, whatever you want to say, messages to me where they said that they really felt they were more sane after adopting the position explained on my channel because the other positions they were they were adopting previously before I discovered my channel they felt were crazy or incoherent or self contradictory or were driving them crazy yeah. and you see that talking to me you see that you know I have my criticism of, of Gary Yurovsky and even though it sounds great at first Gary Yurovsky claiming he literally wouldn't kill a cockroach yeah. that he wouldn't kill any insects that he regards all insects as beautiful he regards insects basically as having a soul and being equal to human 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 beings and any other position as being speciesism. Mm -hmm. So one animal, one soul, and equal rights for all. That's that's his position, and he manages to make a kind of five minute lecture on it that sounds very appealing. It sounds like you know, sounds like some forms of Hinduism. Mm -hmm. Frankly, you know, Hinduism is a very diverse religion, by the way. But you know, it sounds very spiritual and appealing. Try living with it. 
Yeah. Try explaining to meat eaters what your actual program is. Try sitting down with the Parks and Rec board in Toronto and explaining why you don't want them to kill rats. Because downtown city parks can become overrun with rats really quickly. Or, you know, my favorite example is running a um, running an airport. Airports yeah. have to kill birds. You don't have birds flying to the, the aircraft engines. It, it really isn't a working philosophy of veganism or for veganism, even if maybe for you personally, that's how you arrived at veganism in the first place. It's not the way veganism can move, move forward as a movement. And I, just, I think this is, this is true, this question of sanity and sanity. It's, it's true on kind of two levels. There's an abstract level of does the movement make sense on the whole, like when you talk about hundreds of people or the future. Yeah. But there's also just the question of one person alone. Does this make sense for me when I wake up in the morning, maybe when I have to kill cockroaches inside my own apartment, when I have to answer questions in my own life? And a lot of the approaches to veganism, I don't really care whether or not they look crazy from the outside. I care about whether or not they are crazy, whether or not they are driving people crazy. Yeah, but I do understand wanting to become, wanting veganism to become more approachable. Sure. So when you tell people, it's wrong that you have pets. Well, you know, cats and dogs, they can live, you know, cats can live like 20 years if they're in, yeah. if they're in domesticity. So I do understand also the other, the emotional side to thinking that animals are your companions because once they are kind of whipped into shape, you know, I'm not saying sure. that like everybody whips their animals or something, but just uh, when you first have an animal as a very small animal, like, and training them to be your companion. At that point, they seem like, you know, it seems like you can look into their eyes and they know who you are, they know, you know, how you're feeling. So I do right. understand um, humans thinking that their animals are their companions. And it is a very emotional thing for a lot of people, I think. Right. So uh, I can see that that um, that part of veganism for our, the outsider, with people would think it was crazy, but... Um, right. You, okay. You know, right. But look, it I depends mean, on how devoted <laughs> you are. A lot of a lot of technically demanding fields look crazy to an outsider. A lot of things mm -hmm. in science or physics or what have you. Yeah. But really quick, we can do three contrasting examples: chickens, pigs, and then dogs. Mm -hmm. Dogs are the hardest. I'm putting them them third. Mm -hmm. But look, if given half a chance, chickens. Domesticated chickens will revert to living as wild chickens. Mm -hmm. And there's actually concern about this because when they do get a chance, so this is mostly in Southeast Asia where the, the wild jungle fowl is, is native, that they escape from farms and they'll go out and interbreed with. So domesticated chickens will escape into the jungle, they'll interbreed with the wild uh, jungle fowl, yeah. they'll lay eggs together, <laughs> wherever you want to put this, yeah. they'll revert to wild behaviors, they'll go back to, and they're, they're happy to do it. It's what they want to do. They don't want to live in a steel cage. Big surprise, you know, this is they're back in a social setting where they interact with other members of their own species, not with a loving bipedal ape that pets them on the head. Yeah. What the fuck do you think that gesture even means to the species? Chickens don't pat each other on the head. They don't, that's not how they express affection within their own species. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's pretty weird. You know, eating its meals out of the hand of a human being, the same hand that steals its eggs or makes a headdress out of its feathers. I don't know what these people would do with these chickens. You know? um, so, you know, if given a chance, they will revert to the wild mobile behaviors. Now, pigs too, long story short, even the most pathetic domesticated pigs, you see these very pink, fat pigs that yeah. look like they couldn't survive. Don't kid yourself. All over the world, whether it's Australia or Southeast Asia or the Philippines, feral pigs are so common as to be a menace. It's very, very common that domesticated pigs go feral. That happens in some states in the U.S. too. I forget Virginia. Or some states that still have enough forest cover. You get examples of pigs going out and, and reverting to wild behaviors. Domesticated. So that's very clear. And to me, I think we really need to appreciate the gravity of that as vegans and what it means and what indictment it is of the pet-based paradigm. Okay, now you come into dogs. And I think it gets into exactly these kind of precious delusions pet owners have, mm -hmm. that they look into their dog and they know what their dog wants and their dog understands them. And again, petting the dog on the head mm -hmm. and the dog licking your face. I mean, that's, what does that mean within dogs? You know, Jay Costley had a great video talking about that. The actual significance in the wild of dogs licking each other's face is very different from what you might want to believe it is and so on. Yeah, it's actually a sign of submission. It's so, so uh, uh, what is it, a, a gamma dog licking the, the alpha male's uh, face and so it's showing that, yeah, 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 very. So it's them actually recognizing that you're that the you're boss. Alpha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These yeah. really strangely uh, significant things. Well, that's the relationship that it's, that's, sure. You know, that's the relationship that you have with an animal. It's not a companion relationship. It's, it's not, it's not a companion. It's your captive. Yeah. yeah. 
But I, I, I say hard to face up to it. it I you think know, it doesn't feel good once you finally think about it. That I way. think the number one response I get on the issue of dogs is, well, I can't just reintroduce my dog yes. to the forest, right? Mm-hmm. I, okay. Now, <laughs> even if that's true. Is that the point? Obviously, we have so many pigs. The number of pigs is in the billions on this planet. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we cannot reintroduce all pigs to the forest. You know, I don't even think we could we could stop all the factories and introduce one percent of the pigs. And I used to live in Taiwan. Taiwan has more pigs than human beings. They you know they eat and produce a huge number of pigs. Taiwan has basically no forest left. It's a tiny island. There are a couple of parks. You know, there are a couple of habitat preserves, but there's no way you're going to liberate the pigs out of the factory farms into the forest. So I mean. Uh, uh, I understand your point, Mm. but do you understand mine? Mm. Do you understand the point that this pig in a cage on a factory farm does not in its heart yearn to be your pet on the Mm -hmm. carpet and doesn't yearn to be liberated into a sanctuary that is in many ways just a farm minus the slaughterhouse? It's just a farm that goes on forever and ever. It's just Mm -hmm. perpetuating its captivity, but it's the same conditions you get on a farm, on some farms. It's obviously slightly better than the the worst farms. You know, really to understand this species. And again, see, in a sense, I think that the concept of animal rights is already misleading. I can't say this pig has a right to live in the forest. I'm just saying we have to understand and think about this pig in that context of what its life would be in the wild, what it is being deprived of. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, the fact that I can't undo that privation uh, doesn't justify any of, these other, any of these other alternatives or directions, which have become bedrock for the majority of vegans, certainly including a natural vegan who says again and again that this is just about love. Mm-hmm. This is just about whether or not you love the animal. That's the only criterion that makes this moral or immoral. We use animals and people for companionship, for support, you know, emotional support, financial support. We don't consider these practices exploitative or abusive. When we say that using a chicken for her eggs in every situation is abusive, even if she has a loving home with food and water and shelter and was rescued from imminent death, it sends a really confusing message. We're talking about something that very clearly does not do any harm to the animal, and yet it's wrong. Drinking milk, like drinking cow's milk, um, it could be another uh, example of use without exploitation. Yeah, and I can see how that line would lead to, like you said, insanity, because you feel like nothing that you can do is enough. We were just listening to Melanie Joy talking about this. Yeah, great point. Like how you just, you don't have enough time or energy to save every animal that is you know, saved from a factory farm, rescued from a fact, rescue cats and dogs. You don't, nobody has enough time and energy right. to put in all the effort that it would take to keep these animals in captivity. So I don't right. know, I don't know what the answer is, but I don't think, you know, encouraging everybody to rescue animals is the answer. But. In a sense, I mean, what we're debating here is not what are the answers. We're debating what are the questions. Yeah. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, that's the ultimate matter. I, I have this really, from my perspective, deep divide between myself and a natural vegan. Yeah. But we're endorsing the same answer. Mm-hmm. We're just asking very different questions. We're formulating it in a very different way with, I think, different implications and outcomes. Well, but isn't her answer having chickens as backyard hens? In the last video on consent, I included this quote. It's not wrong to use any being, human, or non-human animal for your own ends as long as that use doesn't compromise their own ends. Saying it is, without valid explanation, is what makes veganism look irrational. Um, I, I, so that even, justifies so, keeping them as back here. This is posing the argument by suggesting a parallelism between the ethics of how we treat humans and how we treat animals. So the, the most fundamental premise here is, it is not wrong to use any human for your own ends. I think, I, I don't know what planet you're living on. People like, do that all the time. <laughs> I think there are all kinds of gray areas in exactly, you know, in, she's talking about using, she goes on to say using people and animals for companionship. Mm-hmm. You really don't think that's a morally murky area? I do. Yeah. And specifically what she's talking about is using a person or an animal in captivity mm-hmm. for companionship or possibly as a protein source, etc. you know. So is she talking about the exceptions to veganism or is she talking like generally the exceptions for eggs or, you know, like it's okay to eat eggs from your backyard hens or like in this clip, I'm not quite sure where it's from. I think that is the point. I think is what are the exceptions to veganism 
that make veganism morally incoherent. Her basic premise in this series of videos is that veganism is not morally tenable. Not morally tenable. The purpose of these videos is to explain what it means to be a tentative vegan and why tentative veganism as a moral position makes sense, whereas veganism as a moral position does not. Yeah. Further going to clarify that, that she is against dogmatism in veganism, whereas her own position is allegedly non-dogmatic and is, and is pragmatic as opposed to, I completely reject that. I don't see how you can say it's pragmatic to raise chickens in your backyard. Yeah. What's, what is pragmatic about that? And the excuses she makes for raising chickens, whereas she says it's dogmatic for us to say eating eggs is wrong, even if they are chickens in your backyard. I don't think that is dogmatic. That may be a bit of a shorthand that may be, you know, uh, it, it may not be including what we call desert island scenarios in veganism, mm -hmm. really extreme and bizarre scenarios. But no, I think it's completely consistent and indeed pragmatic to say, no, even if you rescue hens, don't eat their eggs. Mm -hmm. And to say, even if you rescue hens, you're still keeping them in captivity in conditions that are so bizarrely far removed from the life that chicken would lead in the forest that we have to regard it as sub chicken and the same we can talk about subhuman conditions these are sub chicken conditions that's why again with the wildlife management paradigm i often point to zoos as being much more of a positive example than most vegans want to admit to themselves mm -hmm. a zoo that really makes an effort to give penguins habitat that resembles their wild habitat yeah. of course it's not perfect it's not actually antarctica they don't actually have free room to range i've been in zoo enclosures that tried to give birds free, you know, it ultimately had a dome on yeah. the top, but gave them enough space that they could fly around a bit. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I've seen that also with butterflies, a butterfly yeah, enclosure, butterfly. really bizarre. It's a little bit surreal. So it's a simulated environment. Those, I think, are the questions. If for any reason you did have to rescue animals and keep them in captivity, which certainly happens with endangered species, unlikely to be the case with the domesticated chicken. Mm -hmm. Those are the questions I'm asking, or how, how, how closely can you, can you come? And instead, she's asking this set of questions that I find really disturbing and misguided. Yeah, I think it's important for us to discuss these things. It doesn't make veganism look irrational. It's trying, we're trying to come to a conclusion about what veganism is, or you know what, just have discussions about these things. It makes veganism more, uh, I don't know, just the other day we were listening to Tobias say that veganism is not there yet to be... <laughs> Yeah. for somebody to say someone is at a dinner and the person hosting the dinner makes a casserole that has mayonnaise and you say to the you know you say to the person holding the dinner oh this isn't vegan it has mayonnaise so he says that it's crazy right. it's crazy to refuse he, he to says he says this is bad for veganism and it's bad for how vegans are perceived yeah. to insist no i can't eat this casserole it's not vegan yeah because veganism isn't there yet it's yeah. not it's <laughs> it's not a movement that people and in yeah you mentioned like would people say that about being gay you know you can't <laughs> right you would you wouldn't tell your parents that you're gay because we're just not there yet like somebody had to at one point say yes it is it's I there it's there it, whatever the hell that means it's <laughs> it's there yet is yeah. it, it's not there yet isn't the valid excuse anymore yeah. right like, yeah. vegans have to stand up for you know their convictions and what they believe and I, I don't right. think it's wrong for yeah. well, 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 and and does it does it make veganism look more or less irrational? Yeah, like wh what's They're irrational about say no? Yeah, this is the definition. Stuff. This is the definition of veganism. Therefore, eating this casserole is not vegan. Mm -hmm. This is the definition of veganism. Therefore, eating this chicken egg is not vegan. Yes. Why is that irrational, or why does that make veganism look irrational? You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, we can talk about it in a rational or an irrational way, but th this is really, really basic definition of veganism stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, if, if veganism is not there yet, it's never going to get there, wherever there is or whatever that means, yeah. with this kind of excuse making. I just don't see how that's good for the movement. Mm -hmm. And people as well. We use animals and people for companionship, for support, you know, emotional support, financial support. We don't consider these practices exploitative or abusive. Okay, so do we use people in captivity for companionship and emotional support. Mm -hmm. no. I mean, to me, I think you actually could, because I, you know, I used to study Korean Ojibwe, and we did have stories, you know, apparently completely true stories, of human beings who had friendships with wild animals in the forest because they were in the tiny minority of Canadians who actually spend enough time in the forest. Like they just see the same animal again and again over yeah. years, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, oh yeah, that's that otter 
who lives down in that part of the world where they really did know animals and to yeah. some extent like interact with animals without domesticating them, without having them in captivity, and where there is a kind of companionship, like you know, there's a kind of kinship, or even um, so like with with things like otters. I think the, the human would be catching fish, we actually cut up the fish and throw some of the fish to the otter. Yeah, yeah. You know, we had this kind of. So I've read stories from Korean Ojibwe people really living on the trap line, rivet living in the forest, who had those kinds of interactions. Okay, that's one thing. Maybe you can compare that to human companionship, a casual acquaintance, a human being you use in this sense. <laughs> but if I have a human being, the example she's using, if I have a human being and I keep them in captivity so I can cut off their hair yeah. and make sweaters out of their hair, <laughs> what the fuck? What, you know, and you think this makes veganism look less irrational. Say, oh, it's okay when you do it to humans, so it's okay to do it pet. It's not okay when you do it to humans. Yeah. And the, the rationale given it w would never be applied to human beings being kept in captivity. So you have like a, a sheep as a pet and you shear it and you and you wear its its waste. Again, we're talking about essentially a waste product, something that would go to waste if it were not used. And you use it to make, I don't know, knit some gloves out of or something. Again, if assuming that the, the sheep, that the animal is well cared for and loved and all of that and not harmed, what is the harm? What What is wrong with that situation? And the, the rationale given it w would never be applied to human beings being kept in captivity, human beings being ca cut off from their natural surroundings or whatever social situation they would be in if they were not in captivity. I just mentioned that the other day that I was saying, if or you know for your for your daughter i don't, don't want to get too personal but like like you know so for a vegan that doesn't believe in domestic domestication of animals if they have kids yeah. they will have to tell their kids no we, we you know we can't get you a puppy we can't get you a kitten uh because it's wrong and you, it would be difficult to explain to a child why it would be wrong yeah but you know in victoria or just whatever you know, we could go to a harbor and see the same seals right that is true that <laughs> yeah. is true mm -hmm. but I, I guess captivity is, is the crucial word that's missing from this discussion of domestication yeah. because uh, we all recognize the difference between paying money to go in a boat to see whales in the ocean yeah. and trapping whales and putting them in a giant swimming pool and holding them in captivity, mm -hmm. right? So why can't we recognize that with dogs and cats and pigs and everything else? Yeah. You don't have, you know, if you go and visit, you know, a, a wolf pack, I mean, what do you mean? There's no, there's no comparison. Whatever, whatever sense of companionship you get out of seeing wolves or bison roaming over the land, I wouldn't call that companionship. But I don't see in this concept of companionship a rationale for domestication, a rationale for captivity, a rationale for castration and declawing, yeah. and all the other things that come with it. We say that using a chicken for her eggs in every situation is abusive. Even if she has a loving home with food and water and shelter and was rescued from imminent death. <laughs> what does that mean? Shelter. A loving home. A loving home. A loving home. A home where the dog can't pee. D just a, <laughs> dog a has home to be let out. Where a cat has to pee in a box. Just Google. You know, red jungle fowl, the wild form of the chicken. Why? What? What is a loving home to a chicken? A chicken wants to live with its own species. It wants to mate with males of the species. It wants to raise its own children and walk around the forest and catch wild insects and live that life. It doesn't want a loving home, but you know, owned by a bunch of hairless bipedal apes feeding it out of a can. It's it's just ridiculous. A loving home. <laughs> it is. It I is, I, but I don't know. It's just kind of an emotional reaction. It's an emotional response to say that. I, I don't know, because because we're used to seeing animals in the house. We're used to seeing. I, I don't know. A, a loving home, but it's it's a lo it's a human loving home. Yeah. <sighs> Being provided. But it's for not even like how you would treat children. <laughs> yeah. It's not like a loving family. Okay, let's yeah. just today we were walking down the street, we walked past a restaurant and we saw a bunch of birds in cages. You know, yeah. birds because people here in China they keep birds in cages as pets and they put them outdoors so the birds can get some fresh air during the day, right? And you were a bit shocked and horrified at it. I'm a bit more used to it. Yeah. Okay. Does that bird have a loving home? From a human perspective, maybe the answer is yes, because the humans say they love this animal give them and they, water, they give feed them food. it and bathe it and they bring it to the vet when they get sick. So from a human perspective perspective that's loving home from a bird's perspective does the bird ever get to fly yeah does the bird ever get to build a nest does the bird ever get to compete 
with other members of its species to mate and then mate with other members of its species? Does it get to evade its own predators and maybe prey on other animals? You know, all that range of natural instincts and behaviors. That's what matters, not a loving home. And I don't know, maybe you can look at a bird that has its own nest and say that's a loving home from a bird. You know, in the wild, maybe there is a meaningful sense in which a bird can have a loving home, but it ain't this. It ain't my living room. It's a totally ir irrelevant set of criteria, whether it's applied to a, you know, a flying bird or a flightless bird like a chicken or a dog or, or a pig. Uh, but this, this to me is a kind of deep sickness. And if your concern on natural vegan is with vegans appearing irrational, why can't you recognize what's irrational about this? This to me is insane. We're talking about something that very clearly does not do any harm to the animal and yet it's wrong. Uh, just be wary of framing our argument. So we've seen this just really briefly, but she defines the word harm however is convenient for her. So she says that cutting the testicles off a dog doesn't harm the dog. She said that deadpan serious. So obviously, she, the same way she's willing to define suffering any way that's convenient for her argument, she's willing to define harm in any way that's convenient for her argument. Again, I just have to appeal to, please take the time, actually Google what the life of a wild chicken looks like and ask yourself why it is you're making these excuses for keeping a chicken in a cage, in a hutch, in a backyard pen, whatever it is, and you're not looking at the reality of what life would be like for that animal in the wild. Because depriving them of that life is doing them harm. And I think that's totally easy for us to understand the same way that you can't say by putting a human being in jail, you're doing them no harm. Even if you put them in jail where they're given food and shelter, and a loving warden, you know what I mean? Like, it's just ridiculous to say, well, I'm, I didn't do any harm. You're depriving them of another life, a life in the wild or a life in some kind of social standard of what's normal. What an analogy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Deer that's dead that you found at the side of the road. Any comment? It will be eaten by other rodents, by vultures. Just leave sure. it. It's going to decompose. Sure. Don't eat it. What, what about the bears in the forest that might yeah, you're uh, haul off the them of food? <laughs> but also, are we such bears? Are we such vultures? Do we actually have no other moral or even aesthetic standards right. that that make us better than bears and vultures? Because you know, I, th I think there are other considerations there. Sure. Yeah. And you know, why is it that everything's simple? is dogmatic in her view. Mm -hmm. Very often, simple guidelines are pragmatic. Yeah. I think, yeah, maybe it is a simplification to say vegans never eat animal flesh because we can come up with a desert island scenario. We can come up with roadkill scenarios. We can come up with some really weird scenarios. Maybe that's, it doesn't mean it's dogmatic. It, that's pragmatic. Yeah, sure. You know, then there, there's some fine print. There are some footnotes. But come on, there's nothing dogmatic about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. What about rescuing a cat? <laughs> well, you just mentioned that you're depriving them of. I don't even know whatever what life they would have. Yeah, what is natural? And mean, why? Cats are totally. And know, this is the one situation where speciesism matters, right? So we wouldn't say that about a lion. So you've rescued this lion, so now it's okay to keep it as a domesticated animal for its whole life. Hey, I rescued it from hunters, so it's okay to put it in the zoo. It's okay to put it in the circus, or it's okay for me to keep it in my own living room to delight my guests, which has happened historically, by the way. As recently as the, as recently as the 1960s, people used to own lions as pets yeah. uh, in the Western world, and they still do in the Middle East. It's still fairly fashionable in Arab oh, yeah, countries. Yeah. I mean, it's just like you can Google it now. It's still fairly fashionable in leopards and lions mm -hmm. and some of the other big cats. So I'm sorry, I'm not stereotyping, but this actually is talking about the Arab yeah. world. As a, as a unit uh, culturally that's a that's still a phenomenon right now owning those those cats so if I mean so what's the difference you bought it from a breeder or from someone who trapped it in the forest as opposed to you rescued it mm -hmm. no matter which way you look at it owning that ocelot or that tiger or that leopard in your living room for your amusement for your companionship is wrong 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 mm -hmm. but we don't think that way about wolves we don't think that way about dogs we don't think that way about cats yeah. they're just more familiar and yet it does seem strange and bizarre and wrong when we even talk about having a goat in your own home which is also a domesticated animal because what do you what do you mean how can this goat ever be happy in your living room or in your backyard or in your apartment how can a cat ever be happy this is a bizarre and again unnatural in this context natural is worth talking about mm -hmm. you have to cut the balls off the cat you have to tear out its hormonal system it's you know you have to declaw it you're making all these physical and behavioral modifications to the animal and forcing it to pee in a plastic box. Yeah. Uh, for what? 
And you know what, how how it, how does the fact of rescue justify any of those other ethical decisions? For me, it doesn't. Whether we're talking about a lion or we're talking about a cat, cats are simply more familiar, and that is speciesism. That is the question vegans ask again and again when they say they contrast a dog to a pig and say, "Why do you love one and and kill the other?" So you have like a, a sheep as a pet, and you shear it, and you. And you wear its its waste. Again, we're talking about essentially a waste product, something that would go to waste if it were not used. And you use it to make, I don't know, knit some gloves out of or something. Okay, so this is basically exactly the same argument I presented with uh, chickens a minute ago. But I think there's a sense here in which Gary Francione's critique of meat eaters, that meat eaters just regard animals as objects or property, actually applies to vegans. You just regard this sheep as an object, like a piece of furniture you can put in your house and keep. You don't think of it in terms of the complex social interactions that it would have in its own herd, you know, that it would have in the wild. And after watching this, I just went to Google and put in wild sheep. Nothing else. And you get a lot of really eye-opening information. Take a look at what you're depriving this sheep of. This sheep is not an object. It has parents, and its parents have grandparents. Going back a million years, it has a million years of behavior in the wild that really do dictate what a life of dignity would be for this sheep. And that includes all the stuff I've already mentioned in this video, competition within the species, interactions with the opposite sex and with the same sex, and living in a herd, and there's a social hierarchy, and there are all these behaviors and so on. And you are depriving the sheep of all of those things, even if it is in a loving home. You think of it like an object, like a piece of furniture you can just add to your house. And as she asks, she says, what's the harm? Well, if you don't see it in the context of how they would live in the wild, you don't see that you're abstracting this from, you're removing this from, the context in which that sheep would have a meaningful life with its own species and competing to survive and doing all the things that are the whole range of behaviors and instincts that are meaningful for a sheep. What's the harm? The harm is exactly in destroying all of those things for the sheep. Uh, it's, it's a very strange and sick line of reasoning. And it's, the strangest thing to me is that so many vegans find it convincing. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why this video, especially given that it starts by saying that m veganism is morally incoherent in contrast to her position. Yeah. I don't know why more vegans weren't offended by that or didn't just react negatively with that. I've had emails from people who agree with me on this. But there's nothing about this that's seductive or appealing or even useful for vegans. So I, I just don't, I don't see why there are thousands and tens of thousands of people who within veganism back up this position. To us, to my, to my perspective, it only makes our position weaker and worse. Yeah. Oh, but vegan, <laughs> vegan sweaters though. <laughs> you, really, you really think there's like a pragmatic outcome here where vegans can start producing wool? because it comes from a loving home. Really? Like, really? Is that what you're driving at? How do you feel about pets? Do you think that there's any difference between, say, having a dog um, or having a, you know, backyard rescued hen and consuming its, its eggs? Do you see any difference between the two? Because I, I do not. Yeah, that's the point. You don't see yeah. the difference. They're both wrong. So. One's bad and the other's evil. <laughs> Um, I see both relationships as mutually beneficial, assuming that the animals are well cared for. You know, they're receiving food and water and shelter and nurture, and you are receiving companionship and eggs and whatever else. I don't know, maybe you shave your dog and make little hats out of its fur. I don't know. I think the main point is that she's saying it's better than death. So living in a house right. with people is better than death. But, but she doesn't say that. I mean, look, you, yeah. that's a stronger argument. That's not what she says. Because, I mean, when she says this to me, she makes this excuse for companionship, given that you're providing them with food and shelter and water. Mm -hmm. So what's that? Human beings in prison. If you're keeping people in prison indefinitely, mm -hmm. I think one of the only justifications for that is, hey, it's better than better death. Than dying. If they were facing a death sentence and given their choice, would you rather be in prison or die? I think most of them, some people would choose the death penalty. But they'll say, okay, they'll take captivity. Yeah. But no, love does not justify captivity, not in any way. Now, the type of love that's meaningful for a sheep to experience or for a cow to experience is love within its own species. Mm -hmm. It's not being patted on the head by human beings. 
It's going to be that sheep competing for its place within the herd. You know, sheep literally butt heads. You know, they have all these Mm -hmm. bizarre ritualistic behaviors. That's what's meaningful and important to sheep. It's not being petted on the head by a by a bipedal you know hairless ape it's, it's totally irrelevant but if you were taking human beings captive and holding them in prison and saying well they provide me with companionship this whole line of reasoning would seem really sick and demented mm-hmm. although the the argument you just presented it's better than death if the alternative is death i think that's actually a, a stronger argument mm-hmm. and for sure sometimes with endangered species that is the argument where we're saying well look these are the last few members of this breed of bird or something. So yeah. we're going to put them, we, we don't want them to disappear. So we're going to try to have a captive breeding program. Mm-hmm. But even then, the criteria that come into question are how closely can we simulate what their life in the wild would be? And even if you were talking about keeping a pet privately, I would ask that same question. Okay, so you're going to keep lions for whatever reason, they, whether they've been rescued or shipwrecked. I don't know what crazy scenario you got a bunch of lions. I would say, no, the moral justification is not that you love the lions. That's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Not that you pat them on the heads. It's not that you provide them with food and shelter. No. How closely can you approximate what their lives in the wild would be? And for penguins and lions and even something like a cow, that's obviously a huge and difficult and expensive question. And sometimes I got to tell you, I think sometimes death is preferable to what we do with animals. I'm not sure at all that being declawed and uh, castrated and held in captivity and forced to pee in a plastic cubicle and you know <laughs> all the bizarre things we do with it. I think maybe death with dignity. I think that a short life in the wild as a feral dog or a feral cat might in many ways be better than what it is that she has taken as the moral baseline for how we should treat animals, mm-hmm. for what she thinks is right and good for, for treating not only dogs and cats, but all other animals apparently, including sheep, so that you can knit a hat out of their hair. See, that's what the, that's the problem I have with domesticated cats and dogs because you can rescue, like you were saying, uh, there's only a couple of this particular endangered bird left. So let's put them in captivity and have right. a captive breeding program. So it's never that's never going to be the case with cats and dogs. So yeah. I don't know. That's that's my opinion on it. Like I don't see how um, continuing to keep these domesticated breeds of cats in existence is helping anybody <laughs> anybody or anything yeah, yeah. Is, it, is it even good for the cats you know i think also this yeah, is shallow sure. and deep at the same time but there's a really deep misapprehension okay, i just said it was shallow and deep at the same time but look <laughs> uh, uh, unnatural vegan tends to criticize slogans without recognizing that they're just slogans so i mean here she's partly reacting to this slogan all use is abuse Okay, it's kind of a dumb slogan, but it's just a slogan. Mm -hmm. Like, if you scratch the surface with anyone who's literally wearing that T-shirt or that button, you're going to find they have a more sophisticated view about veganism and animal rights and so on. We used to have a a slogan in the anti-war movement, ban the bomb. It's kind of a dumb slogan. And if you actually scratch the surface and talk to those people, they don't actually think that the atom bomb is going to disappear from the world. They say, well, what we want is for more countries to sign this specific treaty, and we want to have them regulated by the United Nations, and blah, blah, blah. It's actually a really complex geopolitical position of what you want to do with nuclear weapons in the future. So stated that simply, I guess nobody really believes in ban the bomb. Stated that simply, I guess nobody believes in all use is abuse. But so what? It's a slogan. You know, I just feel like get over it. Are we are we addressing slogans or are we addressing real problems within the vegan movement? Because I mean, like you know, Gary Yarovsky's position on insects is not just a slogan, and you know, the position of vegans and, and what unnatural vegan is doing here with taking domesticated animals as the moral baseline instead of wild animals. That's not just a slogan. That's a deep seated belief, and we get to see how it shapes all the other steps of her approach to uh, and you know, an advocacy for veganism. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. That, that's a wrap. Ah, bah, le ciel.